In the equilibrium expression, why do these numbers always go here? Isn't that a bit too convenient? And what very public mistake did I make early in my career? Let's find out. Oh, and hang around for the bonus question at the end. Now, chemical equilibria turn up all the way through chemistry, biochemistry, biology and geology. So the world is full of people that have to use the equilibrium expression, but don't really get it. So let's change that. Now, before we go any further, I'm just going to check that you know how much of one reactant reacts with how much of another reactant is called stoichiometry, and that these numbers are called the stoichiometric coefficients. You did know that? Okay, cool. Now, when I was a student, it always seemed a bit too convenient to me that those numbers just went straight into this simple equation and told us what was going to happen in a reversible reaction. Why? Well, it turns out that it all makes perfect sense and it's not actually that difficult to understand. And we're going to start with the first and most essential point. The actual meaning of the equilibrium constant is that it's the ratio of the easiness of the forward and back reaction. That's all it is. That's what this expression is all about. Now, the great thing is that we can put a number to the easiness of a reaction and it's called the rate constant. If you've studied chemical kinetics, then you'll recognize it as the small k from rate expressions like this. And unhelpfully, this is a small k, whereas the equilibrium constant is a big k. And we always have to make sure that we don't mix them up. And if you're not sure about rate equations, I've got a video for you right here that you might want to check out. So the forward reaction and the back reaction both have their own rate constants. And so the equilibrium constant is simply the forward rate constant divided by the back rate constant. Whoopie-doo. But if it's that simple, why are we messing around with this complicated version with all these different numbers and powers of two and stuff? Well, very simply, it's usually easier to find concentrations than rate constants. Oh, and secondly, and I don't like this, but it's a fact of life, it also makes a lovely exam question. So how do we turn this really simple equation with rate constants into this slightly less simple equation with concentrations? Well, it starts by realizing that at equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is exactly the same as the rate of the back reaction. Those reactions don't stop at equilibrium, they are both still going. And if their rates aren't exactly the same, then the mixture is not at equilibrium. Simple as that. So let's take these expressions for the reaction between hydrogen and iodine to make hydrogen iodide. If we just rearrange them to get our ratio of rate constants on the left, forward constant divided by the back constant, the equilibrium expression just pops out on the right. And there you go. Simple as that. That's only one example. What if it's a coincidence? Well, I have a story to tell about that. You see, I just started teaching chemistry and I was trying to work out if this really did work for all reactions, especially because kinetic rate equations often don't match the stoichiometry of the reactants. It certainly worked with every example I tried, but that didn't mean that it always works. I looked on several websites and didn't get any clear answers except for one by a really good educator who said that it only works if the rate equation does match the stoichiometry. There you go. So I put this out on Twitter and it got retweeted by an influential chemistry journal editor. I got a bunch of retweets and then some guy replied to tell me I was wrong. So I replied to tell him, no, he was wrong, actually, and posted the link that I'd found on the internet. Ha <laughs> ha! And then I thought, 
I'd better check it out properly. So how do you think that went? Well, before I tell you, if you could just click the like button for me, it'll help me make more videos. Thanks. So you've probably guessed that I was wrong. And not only wrong, my wrong tweet went out to thousands of people. And I should have apologized at the time, but I didn't have the chance. So sorry, Professor from Twitter, you were right and I was wrong. So let's see what I found out. To understand why the equilibrium constant is always based on the stoichiometric coefficients, let's take a closer look at this tricky example. The reaction looks really simple, with an oxygen atom moving from nitrogen dioxide to carbon monoxide. But when we look at the rate equation, something is very strange. The NO2 term turns up twice, and the CO term doesn't appear at all. Most worrying. We'll talk about why the carbon monoxide has gone missing later, but for now, this weird rate equation tells us that the reaction must be made of at least two consecutive reactions, called elementary steps. And in fact, this one does have two steps, and here they are. Personally, I think there's a third step, but we'll let that go. Now, what we're going to do now is to write out a theoretical rate expression for the total forward reaction, made up from the elementary reactions. And we do that simply by multiplying them together. That's because every term in this equation is really a probability. The concentration terms represent the probabilities of molecules bumping into each other, and the rate constants represent the probabilities of molecules reacting when they do bump into each other. And you know what we do to consecutive probabilities? We multiply them together, right? What are the chances of rolling two sixes on a pair of dice? It's one in 36, right? Now remember, that we're really looking for the ratio of easiness of the forward and back reactions. So let's remember that these two rates are equal at equilibrium, then combine the elementary rate constants into Kf and Kr, and rearrange to get Kf over Kr on the left. Finally, we take out the common terms on the top and bottom, and hey presto, there's our equilibrium expression. And this is no accident. It will happen with any reaction you try. First of all, any compounds that are both produced and react are called intermediates because they don't make it to the end. And because they are intermediates, they will be reactants in both the forward and the back reactions. So they will always cancel themselves out. And if a reactant, like NO2 in this case, reacts too many times, then those extra reactions will always cancel themselves out, just like the intermediates. Always, always, always! But let's look at something else that's weird. If we go back to the experimental rate equation, we see that carbon monoxide isn't there. So why is it in our theoretical rate equation? And why does that work for calculating our equilibrium expression? It's because although the rate equation and the equilibrium expression are related by rate constants, they are actually very different things. The rate equation is only concerned with how fast a reactant is turning into products. More specifically, it's about kinetics or how a reaction happens. In this case, carbon monoxide joins the reaction after the rate determining step. So it does not affect the overall rate of reactants changing into products. But the equilibrium expression is about thermodynamics. The value of the rate constants is related to the amount of activation energy needed for that reaction. But the ratio of the forward and back rate constants is directly related to the difference in energy 
between the reactants and the products. So although carbon monoxide doesn't affect the actual rate of the forward reaction, it does affect the combined rate constant Kf. And that is why it appears in the equilibrium expression, but not in the rate equation. That's why the stoichiometric coefficients always appear in the equilibrium expression, but not in the rate equations. And now it's time for the bonus question. Why do solvents just disappear from the rate equation? But before we do look at that, I just want to say that this video is produced in Kyushu University. It's one of Japan's top universities, and we have science and engineering courses in English, a great alternative in these uncertain times. So check out the link in the description if you're interested. And now, where were we? Oh yeah. Another thing that used to bug me when I was a student is that teachers and textbooks would just say, solvents become unity. And they'd just disappear from the equilibrium expression without any further explanation. Which is ridiculous because there's more solvent than anything else. Why would it not be important? Well, ironically, it's because solvents are so important that they disappear. Or rather, they're set to one, just the number one. It's because the concentration of the solvent is so high, it never significantly changes. So its contribution to the reaction just becomes part of the equilibrium constant. So there you go. You are now a master of the equilibrium expression, but maybe you still have some questions, in which case post them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer a bunch of them. And this is the first in a series of videos about equilibria and reversible reactions. Coming up, we'll see how reversible reactions know how to get back to equilibrium and take a look at some fun real world examples. In the meantime, here's that video on secrets of the rate equation. And here's another one that YouTube thinks you'll like. So check them out and I'll see you next time.